Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, director of the Alabama Center for the Book. The Alabama Center is an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book in Washington, D.C. The mission of the state affiliates is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy, with a special emphasis on promoting the unique literary heritage of each state or territory. The authors in this video are from the Central Two region, comprised of a group of contiguous Midwestern and Southern states of the United States. Their books were chosen by the Affiliate Centers for the Book to represent their state's literary heritage. These so-called great reads from great places are chosen every year by the Affiliate Centers. You can see the entire list from this year and preceding years by visiting www.loc.gov backslash programs. Select the Center for the Book and then the Great Reads from Great Places link. The affiliates of the Central Two region decided to ask their authors two questions. The first question is, the theme of this year's festival is Everyone Has a Story. Tell us a little bit about your story and what inspired you to start writing. Hi, I'm Marcia Edwina Herman Giddens, and I'm the author of Unloose My Heart, and I am delighted to be here. And it's very fun to tell my story, even though it's not always a happy story. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, arriving there when I was almost six years old, and I left in 1966. And so that means, of course, I grew up during Jim Crow. And as a white person, I noticed things even when I was small. I also grew up haunted by my mother's family's line who have a history of slaveholding. And I knew that from a very early age because she and her family and uh, were very proud of that heritage. So I heard a lot about it and even saw notes about some of my, you know, third, fourth great grandparents migrating down with their enslaved people. And then when I reached my early 20s, my young adulthood, I became, which is of course part of the story and too long to tell, but it's all in the book, um, involved as a very minor figure um, in the civil rights movement in Birmingham. And even after the civil rights movement ended up with two of my best friends being some of the first white people to attend Tuskegee Institute as it was at the time, uh, as part of a war on poverty program. Um, so what inspired me to write my story was several things. One, I have already lost, as you can imagine, at my age, which is, I will be 82 in September, many of my friends, and there are very few of us left that I know of that were white people in Birmingham involved with the civil rights movement. So it's a story to tell that you can't read in in books because it was minor roles that are, haven't been written about. I wanted my children to know about it and I made attempts at starting to write several times you know, over the years and just kind of never got around to it. Then in 2016, I had my DA, DNA done and soon discovered that I have um, many African-American cousins. And I think everyone realizes how that comes about when you're from a family of enslavers. And several cousins I've had the privilege to meet and become very close to. And so that is also part of my story, including one that um, our shared heritage is from a slaveholder in Alabama. And then the final thing that really got me going was one evening in 2018, I was idly Googling some of my ancestors and up came a story in the Washington Post that one of my great, great, great uncles may have been a model for Harriet Beecher Stowe's cruel slaveholder, Simon Legree. And that somewhat lit me a fire and I sat down and I started writing. My name is Anna Zeta and I'm the author of U.S. History in 15 Foods. And in some ways, thinking about how I started writing takes me back very early because I've always loved to write. 
um, you know, in the early days as a kid, it was a lot of journaling, a lot of like writing stories, a lot of sort of narrating my own life um, to other people in ways that I was aware I was kind of creating a sense of who I was. Um, and then in college, I sort of was applying very widely for all kinds of scholarships and happened to apply for one that was a writing um, scholarship at Washington University in St. Louis, where I went to college. Um, and I really didn't even think of myself as a writer yet, but I ended up getting this scholarship and it put me into this pretty amazing um, Howard Nemrov Writing Scholars Program, where I got to have weekly writing classes, go to a lot of readings of visiting writers, um, and get a writing minor along the way. And um, even then, when I was doing that, I almost thought of it as something I was doing for a scholarship and less about who I was. But I went, I spent a summer in college at Interlochen Arts Camp in Michigan, and um, there everyone had an art. Everyone was a musician or uh, in theater um, or writing. And when people would ask me, oh, what is your art? I didn't realize that was a question I needed to prepare for. And so I got used to saying, oh, well, writing is my art and thinking of myself as a kind of artist through my writing, even though then I was a biology and environmental studies major and very much focused in the sciences. Um, but I think all of those early origins of my interest in writing maybe would have pre prefigured what I did next, which was that I ended up becoming a historian. I went to um, graduate school to get a PhD um, in the history of science and history. Um, some of my um, mentors have said is one of the last remaining narrative academic disciplines where when you publish you care a lot about the way you're telling the story not just the data or your results or your conclusions and I studied with people who cared a lot about storytelling um, about thinking about what our stories tell about the places we are and the in the past and the present and the future and that kind of emphasis on storytelling has continued to shape my practice such that as I've moved forward in my career, I've found it especially important to think not only about the kind of scholarly contributions I make um, as an academic or a professor, but also about the stories that I'm telling, who's going to read them, what kind of impact they'll have, how the work that I do is about writing at its, at its heart and about readers, about the people who'll be receiving the stories that I tell. My name is Silas House, and my book is Lark Ascending. I am currently serving as the Poet Laureate of Kentucky. I was raised in a really small town in the mountains of southeastern Kentucky in a working class family, um, a deeply religious family, in a community where everybody knew each other. And I was always at the feet of storytellers. And I was really lucky to be raised around people who encouraged me to be an artist, and they they loved that I was writing stories. Um, and so all along the way, I encountered teachers who encouraged me and supported me. And um, I've just I feel really lucky to have been a child who was sort of carried along by my community to to be what I wanted to be. I'm afraid that not all artists get that, and that really shaped me as a writer. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I had a remarkable English teacher who started to work with me and my writing, and she loved literature so much, it, it gave me permission to love literature as well. And so from the seventh grade on, I never wanted to do anything but be a novelist. Hi, I'm Maurice Ruffin, uh, Maurice Carlos Ruffin. I'm the author of The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You. And uh, you know, my story is a New Orleans story. It's a Louisiana story. It's an American story. Um, I come from a place that is known for its music and its food, but uh, those are just different versions of storytelling. And for me, literature is all about telling my community stories with as much um, honesty and compassion and complexity as possible. Um, I was raised by parents and uh, my grandparents who were also great storytellers. And for me, it's a, um, an honor to follow a new tradition and put things down on the page so that people all over the world can know what my, my city is like. My name is Katie Simpson Smith and my book is The Weeds, which came out this spring. Um, 
And I have a pretty circuitous story as a writer, I would say. Um, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and was always writing stories on the side, writing little poems, um, but didn't really take myself seriously for a pretty long time. Um, and I think that is a common experience to a lot of writers out there. We begin with this sense of great passion and excitement and love for language. And then we're told over time that it's not an, uh, it's not really a career option, it's, it's a hobby. And so we put it to the back burner. Um, I think this is true for so many art forms, visual art, dance. It's something that we express as young people that then kind of gets beaten out of us in various ways. Um, so I went off to college and thought, okay, what else can I do that is adjacent to storytelling? Um, and I decided to be a, a filmmaker. I thought I could make movies and tell stories that way. And, and then of course you get rich and famous. And uh, I went out to Los Angeles for a summer and did an internship in Hollywood. And it was so disorienting and alarming in many ways. And I thought, oh, this is, this is not the path for me. Uh, so I returned to college and thought, okay, what's my plan B? Uh, and the next most like serious thing I could think of that, that told stories in the way that I wanted to tell them was to pursue history. So I went to graduate school in history um, I thought I would become a history professor. Both my parents are professors. Uh, and I got access to these archives that were just filled with people's experiences and, um, and, and riveting stories from the past that it felt like only I had access to because there were these crumbling uh, pages. Um, but there were so many holes in those sources. Um, there's so much that you can't tell about someone's emotions and experiences in the past, especially if they didn't leave a lot of records behind, which includes women, which includes enslaved people, free people of color, um, Native American groups. Uh, and so in those holes were all the things that I actually wanted to talk about, which is love and grief uh, and despair and optimism. Uh, and so at that point, I realized the only way to really speculate about the lives of people in the past was through fiction. And I enrolled in an MFA program. I started writing fiction. And all of a sudden, it felt like all the pieces of my life fell into place. Um, and that this is what I was meant to be doing the entire time. Uh, and I don't regret any of the twists and turns that my path took. Um, but I, you know, encourage young people who are starting out as writers to really recognize that what they are doing is not silly. It's not um, a hobby. It can be something that is deeply meaningful and is a way to express the human condition um, in just as valid and serious a way as any other kind of more academic pursuit. My name is Vivian Gibson, and I'm the author of The Last Children of Mill Creek. I think my story is um, that of a retired person who uh, decided to revisit uh, stories, paragraphs, and thoughts, and memories that I had accumulated for probably 40 years. So I decided to join a creative writing group because I'm retired and I have time to do it. And um, to my surprise, I uh, enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing. I, I enjoyed having others read my writing because I'd never shared any of those stories before. And um, so being part of a writing group uh, kind of morphed into um, submitting stories for publication online to literary magazines, to anthologies. And somehow my stories uh, made it to a publisher, Bell Publishing in Ohio. And uh, long story, very short, uh, my book um, came to be. And uh, it's a, an interesting story about my life my childhood, um, stories that I had hoped to write for my children, but it turns out that it was a, a decisive time 
in our uh, city's history and our country's history. And these stories seem to resonate with uh, lots of people. It also coincided with uh, COVID-19 and the country shutting down. And it turns out that once my book was published, I had the time at home alone to uh, promote these stories and get them out to the community. And uh, it's been a real ride for me to see how uh, the stories have been received, the book has been received, and uh, I'm spending a lot of time today uh, talking to people, to book clubs, to students. Um, the book has been uh, part of a curriculum for um, university level, for middle school level, and it's, a, and it's had a broad appeal that I just did not expect. I uh, The book is uh, being taught at the seventh grade level and it's been taught at Washington University. So, uh, and 70 year olds are at uh, book clubs reading it. So I can't explain just this broad, broad appeal of this book, but I'm pleased about it. Hey, I'm Julia Bryan Thomas and I have written a book called For Those Who Are Lost wanted to be a writer ever since I was a little girl. I loved books. I loved literature. And I exchanged letters with my grandmother when she moved away in which we wrote stories and poems and shared with each other that way. And it encouraged me that I was a writer and I always would be. Hi, everybody. It's Ann Patchett at Parnassus Books in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am here today to tell you about my new book, which is called Tom Lake. It's coming out on August 1st from HarperCollins. And it's a story about um, a family that has gone home to their cherry orchard in Michigan during the pandemic. The three daughters, all in their 20s, are home to work on the farm because nobody is there to work on the farm. And they force their mother, Laura, to tell them the stories about when she was in her 20s and she was in love with a guy named Peter Duke who went on to become the most famous movie star of his age. And it's a story about two different kinds of love. The kind of love that you have in your 20s when you're completely out of your mind and burning the house down and not totally responsible and the kind of love that you have in your 50s if you're lucky where you have somebody great who's stuck around and you have some great kids and you have this beautiful farm and the work is hard and it's every day. And the daughters who are still in their 20s do not understand why their mother wouldn't rather be with crazy burn the barn down movie star instead of their wonderful, reliable father who in fact they really love. So that's what it's all about. It also centers around Tom Lake because when Laura was young, it centers around Tom Lake. It centers around our town, which actually Tom Lake is the name of the theater company where Laura and Peter Duke met and they are playing in our town together. So themes from our town come up again and again. The second question that the Central Two affiliates had for their authors was, what is your Great Reads from Great Places book about and how do you and or your work connect to the state that selected it? And growing up in Birmingham at that time was, it was traumatic. And I'm realizing actually through the writing of the book, how traumatized I was. And of course, compared to African-American people who lived in Birmingham, I have no, no standing really to be so traumatized, but it was traumatizing for everyone. You know, we were all affected. Um, so, and my children were all born in Alabama. We moved away in 1966 because things were still really bad there. and We wanted a better uh, situation and environment for them to grow up in. But my connections are very deep. And a number of my ancestors went to Alabama. Uh, there was one, one line, the McAlpin line, which is the cousin that from the same line that my cousin we have, con that have connected with is from from South Alabama, which was Greene County at the time, was one of the largest slaveholders over several generations. 
and obviously one of them, one of my ancestors had um, raped one of his slaves and that resulted in my cousin um, now that I know and very close to, which has been a um, wonderful, very healing experience. So I also write in the book about it being in a number of other places in Alabama, such as Tuskegee Institute. I went back to Tuskegee the following summer to participate in what I would best describe as a pre-Head Start program that was for uh, just for African-American children. These were still the days that it was against the law for black and white people to be in the same room or area together, unless the black people were in some sort of service role, like custodian or a maid or something. So it was very dangerous for any of us that did anything together in mixed groups because you never knew when there might be a bomb threat um, and and worse. So, And another place I write about is Selma. It's I go into detail and I'm so pleased to have been able to do this because there was a white march, an all white march in Selma supporting voting rights for African-American people that never got much press because the very next morning was Bloody Sunday, which most people know about. So it got pushed out of the news, but it but well, there were 70 of us. And I was so pleased to be able to uh, to be able to write about that and share that with people because it's another one of those stories that's just missing from regular books on civil rights. So all of what I've written, of course, is interwoven with a study of um, my ancestors who were slaveholders and what I could learn about them and what I learned from studying all that. I think the final thing that is really important that I wrote about was one of my goals was to look at how I personally benefited from the slaveholding in my mother's family. And I learned that I did. You know, in summary, it would be some, some a little bit of wealth, although a lot was lost during the Civil War, and uh, education, you know, social class, agency, all kinds of things. So my book is U.S. History in 15 Foods, and the title tells us a lot about what it is. I retell um, the major kind of turning points in American history, many of which readers will be familiar with, but I tell them through the lens of food, showing how food was really central for, to the founding of the, of the nation, to indigenous peoples before colonization, to the Civil War, to um, the 1950s, and, and really all throughout American history, how food has been at the center. And food more generally is very much about who I am and where I'm from. Um, one thing, you know, you are what you eat is a well-known phrase for the reason that food really tells us um, who we are, our identities. And when I think about my own rising interest in food, how I came to write this book and study food more broadly, it has a lot to do with my kind of academic training, the sort of things I've studied, but even more and even earlier, I think my interest in food came from a personal and family experience, which was very much rooted in my childhood in Arkansas, um, which is where I was born and lived through high school. And um, my, my origin story is interesting because my parents were both um, Soviet Jewish immigrants who came to rural Arkansas in the early 1980s in this Cold War moment when they were very much among the only people um, with accents in this small town in Arkansas, in so southeastern Arkansas where I grew up. Um, and my they moved there because my dad had dreamed his whole life growing up in Moscow in the one of the biggest cities of the world. He dreamed of living in the woods, of growing his own food, of living on the land, of walking to work through the woods every day. Um, and so that he ended up getting a job there as a forestry professor at the University of Arkansas Forestry School. And he did that. He had a huge garden. He spent pretty much all of his hours outside in the woods, both growing food and also foraging, um, foraging mushrooms, wild berries, fruit. And I grew up very much in this sense that food was a defining part of our interactions with the natural world, as well as with cultural experiences. My, my mom was um, an amazing cook, is an amazing cook, and 
For her, food was a form of love, of care, of celebration. Um, she cooked a lot of Russian and Jewish dishes, Ukrainian dishes. And whenever people would come visit, the table was always just spread with, you know, 20 different plates in a way that wasn't common among my American born um, friends and their parents. And, and that way of growing up with food as this kind of dual meaning of cultural and environmental links really highlighted for me how deeply important it was, how much it marked us as different from other people, and also how it allowed us to connect with other people when we would host and have these meals together. And so I think those early meanings of food, not just in a historical sense, but in a present day sense, really helped me to see how much looking at something as simple as what we have for a meal opens up this entire world of origin stories, of understanding why we eat what we eat, where it comes from, whose labor provides it, what kind of impact it has on the environment and on the animals um, and plants that our foods comes from. And when you think about food, you have to then think about history and politics and gender and colonization and um, environmental impact and all of these other themes that my book U.S. History in 15 Foods um, explores. And, and it's very much rooted in those Arkansas woods that I grew up in and that my parents um, came to claim as their own. Lark Ascending is about community. It's about profound grief. It's about creating a family. It's about the relationship between people and dogs. Um, it's set in the near future, and um, an Appalachian family has uh, been forced onto a refugee boat um, because of a, a burning America, uh, burning politically and physically. And um, they are going through the refugee experience and only one of them survives and makes it to Ireland. And there he walks across Ireland with a dog who is awful. Also grief stricken like he is. Um, even though this book is pretty global in nature, it, it takes place uh, all over the Eastern seaboard and across the Atlantic and Ireland. My character is still seeing the world from a Kentuckian point of view. Um, Kentucky is so deeply ingrained in me that that's the way that I think about the world, period. And so even when I'm not writing specifically about Kentucky, I'm writing from a Kentucky point of view. So uh, my book, The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You, is a short story collection. And it is uh, 19 stories that span history. The uh, earliest story is set in 1866. The latest story is set contemporaneously, actually during the uh, George Floyd protest and the pandemic. So it's pretty late in terms of time frame. The stories uh, pretty much all take place within the city limits of New Orleans. And you know, my idea was that um, New Orleans has a great history of uh, literature uh, from people uh, like William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams and Truman Capote and Sherwood Anderson and, and the like. Um, but definitely I thought that we, we needed to see more stories uh, by folks from my community, by African-Americans who uh, maybe their stories were told in song, but not so much in literature. And so these 19 stories are designed to feature a variety of uh, main characters and narrators. So just for example, uh, one of my stories features a middle-aged uh, lesbian lady and I'd never seen uh, a black woman with that sort of background in the story as the main character. And so I gave her actually the longest story in the book, which is a novelette of about 30, 38 pages give or take. Also many of the stories are based on uh, my ancestors and some of their stories that they've told, um, as well as the people who, you know, within the last 10 years uh, have been in high school in New Orleans, seen some of the changes in the post-Katrina era, um, as well as in sort of protest era in the pandemic era. The Weeds is uh, a novel that is based on a botanical flora, which is a kind of scientific text that documents all the species of plants growing within a given location. Um, in this case, the flora that I am basing the book on uh, is about the plants that are only growing in the Roman Colosseum. So that's a six acre space that has a very confined ecosystem. Uh, but there was a botanist in the mid 19th century that counted 420 species of plants in that space. Um, so when I heard that story, 
first there was this marvelous image of a jungle that gets conjured up, right? Like how could you know these huge trees be growing in the space that we consider so sanitized and bare today? Um, and the second thing I thought of was a structure that if I could write a novel that used each plant species as a kind of mini paragraph or prose poem, that I could tell the narrative of um, these characters in a way that was episodic and a little bit more experimental. Uh, so I end up following two women, both botanical assistants, one in the mid 19th century, who is doing all the dirty work of actually getting down on hands and knees and counting the species and figuring out you know, what one weed is versus another. Um, and then the second narrator is uh, a graduate student in botany in the present day, whose job is to um, replicate that catalog from the 19th century and see what species are still growing, what's been eliminated as a result of climate change. Um, and both women are working under these sort of strong male characters who have very specific ideas about gender and science um, to the women's detriment, I would say. Um, so my, my contemporary narrator, uh, I decided to have her be from Jackson, Mississippi, which is the first time I've ever written about Mississippi in a book. And it was a little bit terrifying. Um, I was born and raised in Jackson. I feel so attached, not only to the state, but to that literary community, which is, uh, just stacked with heavy hitters, <laughs> um, Eudora Wealthy uh, actually lived in my house for a few months when she was a teenager. Um, and there's so many other great people from, from Jackson specifically, but also from Mississippi that the, the pressure of that, um, I think has always intimidated me. I thought, okay, I can maybe write about different parts of the human experience, but I can't ever write about Jackson. I can't compete with Wealthy. Um, but it turns out that as I was writing this character, I was able to like exercise a lot of my own demons about growing up as a Southern woman, specifically um, as a woman who was taught to be sort of quiet and sweet and um, repress a lot of the bigger emotions. Uh, and I think I've always used fiction as a way to, to talk about emotions that are deeper than I've been able to say verbally. But for the first time, I, I found myself with this character who's growing up experience really replicated mine in a lot of ways. Um, and that was challenging, but so much fun to sort of give her voice um, all the things that my voice, I think, lacked as a young person. Uh, and the sort of one of her, uh, the climactic things in the book is that she decides that she wants to write a flora of the Jackson Coliseum. Uh, and as anyone from Jackson knows, the Coliseum is this sort of epic piece of architecture in our city, uh, which has changed over the years and represents both the kind of uh, colossal promise of what we could be as a community in terms of celebration, um, coming together, uh, but has also, you know, fallen into states of disrepair over the years and reflects the way um, so much of the infrastructure in our city has um, not been taken care of uh, specifically by by the state. Um, and so it felt political too, uh, to be writing this woman who has a lot to say about what is valuable. Um, and what is valuable is not just the beautiful flowers, but also the weeds. Um, it's not just Rome, but it's also Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it's not just men, but it's, you know, young women who are otherwise uh, might feel silenced. Um, so in those ways, writing about Mississippi for the first time uh, felt like a kind of revelation for me as a writer. My book is about, I guess from 30,000 feet, it's about human relationships and um, fairness and unfairness in our society. Uh, the book takes place uh, at mid-century, uh, at, at a time, a decisive time when the when the country has fallen in love with automobiles and uh, we're building highways all over the city, I mean, all over the country. Uh, and St. Louis is no different. Um, the highway happened to be uh, planned for a place where um, 
my family lived and it happened to also be a segregated part of a black community of 20,000 people called Mill Creek, hence the name of the uh, book, The Last Children of Mill Creek. I was in fact part of that last generation of children who lived in this community that was demolished and just about, just about uh, erased. I think if it wasn't for uh, conversations around this book, I, I think a lot of people would not have even heard of or remembered that Mill Creek even existed. The stories are told from the perspective of a young girl, which is me, and, uh, and it's about our community, our family, our institutions, our churches, uh, and, and how we were impacted by having to just disperse this community and uh, move on. And uh, I think the stories are, are vital to a history of St. Louis and Missouri and uh, how the city developed and how it looks and why it looks the way it does today. Since the book has been out and the reading has uh, been so broad, not only in Missouri, but across the country, um, there's been so much recognition. Uh, I'm happy to say that there's even a monument that's been um, erected in the footprint of Mill Creek in downtown St. Louis outside of the new soccer stadium that we have a new soccer stadium in St. Louis and a soccer team and a block long tribute to Mill Creek uh, made of granite and stone and, and it is absolutely beautiful because that soccer stadium is in the footprint of what's, what was once that Mill Creek community. So having this book be so prominent and people talking about it, I think it just resonates with history and bringing back and, and recognizing a group of people in a community and a society that uh, had been forgotten. And I don't think we're going to be forgotten again. I have, I'm a longtime teacher. I've taught for 25 years in Oklahoma, and I was born and raised here. And when I came across some information about World War II, and the evacuation of 5,000 children in a single day from the island of Guernsey, I knew that as a teacher and as a mother, it was something that I was interested in and that I felt needed to be shared with other people. My book is about two women, one who is a mother who has 24 hours to decide whether to send her children off for the duration of the war or to keep them on an island that's about to be occupied, and one is about a woman who becomes accidentally involved with this family and ends up making decisions that splits that family up indefinitely. No one knew the war was going to last five years, but all of the choices that they made in the blink of an eye had long-term ramifications. And many of those children who evacuated were evacuating with their teachers. As a teacher myself, I really felt that feeling of what it was would be like to take your children, your students, and go to a foreign country with them and live with them for perhaps years. That was the story I wanted to tell. The reason that I became a writer is because I didn't know how to do anything else, including type. I don't know how to type because I always thought if I took typing in school, I would wind up being a secretary. That's what we called them back when I was young. And so I thought I'm not gonna have anything to fall back on. I'm just gonna be a writer. And that's all I ever knew how to do. And while I am very, very proud that Tom Lake is representing Tennessee, it should in fact represent Michigan because that's where the book is set. But I'm set in Tennessee and Parnassus Books is set in Tennessee. So thank you very much for the honor. Really, really glad to be a part of this program. Thanks.